change is inevitable in basically all factors of life. You can fear it, run from it, but it arrives all the same, each and every time. Yu-Gi-Oh! much like everything else is susceptible to this inevitability, as we often see major changes with the implementation of each master rule as well as various rule changes on the tournament level throughout the years. But one of the things that I find most fascinating in our game is when a powerful card is released and it fundamentally changes how the game is played. Maybe it makes players more cautious and play a bit more defensively. Or sometimes it's the opposite and it riles up their aggression. Regardless of the behavior, the fact that a single card can alter the way that we play in such a meaningful way is astounding. To that end, I've decided to create a new series around some of these juggernauts to help newer duelists appreciate and understand why certain moves, techniques, and small tendencies exist in Yu-Gi-Oh! and also where they originate from. In these videos, I'll of course cover the origins of the featured card as well as why and how it changed the game. Welcome to Yu-Gi-Oh! Cards That Changed Everything. For this episode, we're going to be putting our focus on the legendary Gore's Emissary of Darkness. Gore's is a curious case where we actually need to go back further than I intended. Gore's debuted right in the middle of Teledad format for the TCG, however the card originally launched years earlier in the OCG, September 6, 2006 to be exact. Not to break immersion here, but I vividly remember Gore's' TCG release and how monumental it was. The sheer thought of it being legal for like half of GX for our Japanese brethren is pretty mind blowing from a TCG player's perspective. Gores was released for the OCG as a promo in one of the Yu-Gi-Oh! R manga volumes. I feel compelled to point out at this time that during GX and 5Ds, it was pretty much common practice for incredibly strong or outright broken monsters to be released in the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga volumes. Think Thunder King Ryo, Light and Darkness Dragon, which both saw their TCG releases in GX manga. Gores, like these others, was another entry in a long line of cards so good that duelists were willing to spend $10 or so just on the manga volume itself to obtain a copy of the card. Messenger of the Underworld Gores, aka Gores Emissary of Darkness, was a near unrivaled absolute powerhouse upon its release in the OCG. A level 7 Dark Fiend with a staggering 2700 attack and 2500 defense. Gores was a high level monster, but didn't technically require any tributes to summon. Instead, Gores had a summoning condition unlike anything the game had seen. Gores required you to take damage from your opponent while controlling no cards on the field. At that moment, Gores would spring into action as well as his powerful second effect. After Gores was summoned, he'd either spawn a token with stats equal to the battle damage you had just received or inflict direct damage back to your opponents equal to the damage they had inflicted upon you. Either way, you were basically getting payback on them. And ironically, the harder they hit you, the harder Gores hit them back. This on face value single-handedly demanded and straight up forced players to change their habits. Prior to this, and throughout all of Yu-Gi-Oh! history, when attacking your opponent directly on an open field, the order in which you attacked never really mattered. And why would it? You could attack high to low, attack in order in which you summon the monsters, or even use your favorites to battle first. The damage was always going to add up to the same amount, and since you were swinging into an open field, they couldn't have any surprises to punish you, like Call of the Haunted. But Gores flipped this notion on its head, because now all of a sudden, a completely open field wasn't the green light to victory or to attempt to OTK your opponent it had always been. For Gores could be sitting in your opponent's hand, just laying in wait, a literal hand trap biding its time. When the battle phase began and attacks connected, Gores would take action, ready to completely flip momentum and seize control of the game. You probably already know this, but attacking with your highest monster early on was a great way to get massively punished by Gores. Not only would the Gores token have stats equal to your strongest monster, and thus almost always survive that battle phase, but if by chance your highest attack monster was stronger than Gores itself, well it would have already attacked and simply running him over wouldn't be an option anymore. I guess you could technically say that Gores was like a double punishment. Keep in mind, negation effects and cards that are all too common in current Yu-Gi-Oh! were infinitely more scarce during the first three eras of the game. In addition, in battle phase situations like what I'm describing, Gore summoned itself during the damage step, which made it notoriously difficult to stop. 
For these reasons, after no time at all, it became completely standard in the OCG to always attack going in order starting with your lowest attack monster to your highest attack monster. Going this route of course didn't stop Gorge from being summoned or remove the threat, but it did mitigate and minimize the potential damage you'd receive if your opponent actually had it. We're gonna activate Chateau and then we should have close to lethal. All right, let's get in for three and Right, I forgot that they could theoretically have a Druid Swarm in hand. All right, uh, should have attacked around Gores, my bad. Uh, let's see if we threw. It also maximized your damage in the same situations. You could argue that having to adjust and do this because of the existence of a single monster was incredibly tedious. And you know what? You'd probably be right. However, this legendary messenger from the Underworld was completely unlimited in the OCG September 2006 format and he warped the ever-living hell out of it. Due to the rise of fast Airblade Turbo builds and future fusion-powered Chimera Tech OTKs, Gores was seen as an anti-OTK godsend that seamlessly fits into basically any deck. Gores was a gigantic tempo-changing card that almost assured you couldn't be OTK'd at any given time, and more importantly, made committing to the board less important. Why set three cards face down and get blown out by a heavy storm when you could just pass with an empty board, knowing that your opponent can't OTK you, and even if they do attack you directly, you'll just drop gores on them and go plus one in the process. Starting to understand how powerful this card was? In situations like that, despite committing literally nothing to my field on my opening turn, I could effectively punish my opponent for doing exactly what we've all been taught to do in Yu-Gi-Oh! since the very first day we started playing the game. Now, since I had two monsters to my opponent's one, the onus was on them to stop my push during my next turn, and Mirror Force, which was limited, was pretty much the only easy answer that wouldn't see them lose card advantage. It's also worth noting that despite all of Gores' powers, the card wasn't a Nami monster and could easily be discarded with something like Graceful Charity and then reborn if the opportunity arose. In addition to that, Gores could even beat out hand ripping effects like Spirit Reaper or Don's Lug. As crazy as this sounds, since Gores would be an optional effect of the non turn player, it would go on the chain as Chain Link 4. Even if he was the only card in their hand, Gores would summon itself before being discarded by the aforementioned Reaper or Don's Lug. Take that, rulings. I don't use this term very often, but all things considered, especially the fact that for the OCG this was GX era and not 5Ds, Gores, much like Breaker the Magical Warrior during DM or Stratos and Cyber Dragon in GX, was basically a perfect monster. The only downside was having to have an open field, but as I mentioned earlier, in many situations, that actually helped you not get punished via overextension with blowout cards like Heavy Storm. The overabundance of gores combined with the prolific effect that the card had on the OCG's September 2006 format almost assured that it would be addressed on their next limit regulation list update, and that's exactly what happened. On the March 2007 list, it and Elemental Hero Stratos, who were emphatically the two best monsters in the game at the time, were both moved to limited status where they remained for years. This leads me to the TCG release of the card, which occurred in late November 2008, pretty much the middle of the TCG Teledad format. Gores launched as the only secret rare in the very strange Dark Legends side booster set. The set wasn't very impressive, but every Dark Legends package came standard with a copy of Gores. There was no RNG, and you were guaranteed to get your copy. This made the card widely available in North America upon release, and Gores didn't disappoint, as it was immediately implemented into Teledad and Lightsworn builds as a fantastic anti-OTK card that hit with a lot of power. Gores was also released in the TCG at a time where players couldn't use Graceful Charity, but we did have access to Allure Darkness to reduce the odds of the card ever being dead in your hand. Gores was still excellent during this time, but nowhere near perfect or best monster in the game as it had previously been in the OCG. For one, Upper Deck limited the card prior to its release on the September 2008 TCG ban list, so any thoughts of the card running rampant at 3 died immediately. Secondly, we received Gores post synchros, and that meant that Gores unfortunately had a few natural predators that never existed when the card debuted during GX in the OCG. 
Goyo Guardian and Colossal Fighter, for example, were both hard counters to Gores as they edged them out just slightly in terms of attack value. Goyo Guardian could hugely punish Gores by stealing him, and Colossal Fighter was a monster that specialized in doing battle. Even in events where Book of Moon or Enemy Controller were used to put Colossal Fighter in defense mode, it really wouldn't matter if Gores ran it over as it would just resummon itself and threaten to destroy Gores in battle during the next turn. In addition, Dark Arm Dragon and Judgment Dragon were excellent one card answers to Gores that could deal with him and the token he summoned without expending meaningful resources. The OCG had access to none of these counters, as well as more copies of Gores, which of course led to it warping their metagame completely. Despite more answers and even downright counters in the game, Gores still flourished in the TCG throughout 5Ds, and even saw significant play in the Zexal. Part of this could be attributed to the release of the potent hand trap Maxi and how well it synergized with Gores. If your opponent took the Maxi challenge, Gores was one of, if not the best possible draw in many situations to ensure your survival. Gores was played in the likes of Dino Rabbit, Mermill, and even Dragon Ruler variants. Sadly, the card, like nearly everything in our game, would eventually fall out of the metagame completely and victim to power creep post arc V, as Yu-Gi-Oh became far more archetype driven and players wanted cards suited to facilitate their specific plays. Gores has seen almost no competitive play of note over the last two eras of Yu-Gi-Oh, but interestingly enough, even to this day, when attacking in two completely open fields, duelists will still follow the law of Gores, or at least jokingly bring it up. And with that, we are at the conclusion to this Yu-Gi-Oh! video. If you enjoyed it, or more importantly, you learned something, let me know by giving the video a big thumbs up or giving me your thoughts and comments in the comment section below. Thank you for watching as always. Check out the other videos that are probably on your screen right now. And then, of course, a gigantic thank you to my patrons. We could not do this without you. My old buddy and rival, Garen Williams, Brian Ford, Volnuff, Israel Diaz, Ernesto Sanchez, and then my Twitch crew, Akinacism, Big Pimpin, and Super Canadian. If you'd like to become a patron or learn more, of course, the link is in the description below.